All right, picking back up, here we go. We're going to do a couple of manipulation techniques. So we know the expansion for E, the expansion for sine, and the expansion for cosine. And some of those other ones, they come up occasionally, but it's really E, sine, and cosine, they come up a lot, right? And sometimes if we know those basics, we can, we can kind of pull them up and then use them and manipulate them in order to get something else. And I, and I don't necessarily have to reprove everything from scratch. Like here, this example says, find a Maclaurin series for sine of x squared. And it says, give the first four non-zero terms in the general term. Okay, like that's cool. Uh, I don't want to have to take all the derivatives myself and then tack on all the stuff. Could I? Yes. Do I want to? No, definitely not. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the expansion uh, for sine of x, right? But then we're going to take that expansion for sine of x, and we're just going to change the x's to x squared, right? Because that's all f of x is, right? This is now sine of x squared. So I'm going to take that sine expansion, and I'm going to change the x's to x squared. And that's going to give us the expansion for sine of x squared. Here we go. f of x, which is sine of x squared. We can approximate it. I'm going to go do the sine expansion, and then I'll come back and edit it. Remember, the sine is x uh, minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial plus dot, 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 and then it was negative 1 to the n, and then I had x to the 2n plus 1 over the 2n plus 1 factorial, right? That was what we learned in the last video. There's our expansion for sine, but I need to now change the x's to x squared. So here, check this out. I'm just going to do it, right? It's going to be x squared, x squared cubed, x squared to the fifth, x squared to the seventh, and then that's going to be x squared to the 2n plus 1, right? We're just changing the x's to x squared. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to have to use another line for this one. So here we go. This f of x expansion, right? It's going to be x squared, x squared cubed. That's going to be x to the sixth over 3 factorial plus x to the tenth power to a power, right? You multiply those things over 5 factorial minus x to the 14th over the 7 factorial plus dot dot dot. The alternatingness hasn't changed. So it's still that negative 1 to the n. Now the factorial piece also didn't change. Uh, but what's different is, is now it's like twice as big. So now I'm going to have x. And you could either do 2 times 2n plus 1, right? If you want, you could do that. Uh, or you could do 4n plus 2. It doesn't, doesn't really make any difference. Uh, but there we go, right? That would be our answer to part A. That would be our expansion uh, for sine of x squared. We took the expansion for sine, and then we changed the x's to x squared. Okay, and then this follow-up part, how could we potentially do the expansion for f prime? Could I take the derivative? Let's see. The derivative of sine of x squared would be cosine of x squared times 2x. Right? That's what the f prime function would be. Could I build my expansion from scratch? Could I then take that, treat that as my new base function? Could I take derivatives, tack on the stuff to build it from scratch? Yes, but I don't want to. I don't want to take the derivative and then do the expansion. Instead, let's just take the derivative of the expansion, right? Instead of, ex instead of doing the derivative and then expanding and building it all over, like, like we've got the expansion of the original function, we can just take the derivative of it. So here we go. What is the expansion of 2x cosine x squared? Well, take the derivative of, of the f expansion. 2x minus 6x to the fifth over 3 factorial plus 10x to the ninth over the 5 factorial minus 14x to the 13. That is just a power rule for all those numerators. Plus dot, dot, dot. The, the alternatingness hasn't changed, so this is still going to be negative 1 to the n. The factorial, the denominator hasn't changed, so that's still 2n plus 1 uh, factorial, uh, but the numerator has changed, right? Because now that, that thing is going to kick down to the front. So now you probably would want to write it, right? Instead of, you could write it as 4n plus 2. You could have left it uh, as 2 and then 2n plus 1, or you could have multiplied it out. But here you're going to have 4n Come on, smart board, you're really frustrating me today. We're going to have 4n 
plus 2 times x to the 4n plus 1 power. Woo, and then that's kind of an uggo for the general term. And remember, dot, dot, dot afterwards. But that would end up being the answer for the part B. I know it was kind of, I got a little bit sloppy and kind of had to fit it in. Uh, but we didn't have to rebuild a whole new expansion. We have the expansion for sine. I can manipulate it to get sine of x squared. And then if I have to get the derivative of that function, I could then just take the derivative of the expansion. The derivative of the expansion is the expansion of the derivative. And it's easier to just take the derivative of that expanded thing than to have to rebuild a whole brand new one from scratch. Okay, let's keep practicing with some of these manipulation techniques. All right, flip it over. Here's my next page. Here we go. It says find a Maclaurin series for x cosine of x, and then uh, and then we're going to manipulate it, I think, to get the integration. Okay, well here I'm going to take my cosine expansion, and then I'm going to take it and I'm going to multiply by x. Right? I'm going to take the cosine expansion and then just multiply everything by x. Again, let me just kind of remind us, what's the cosine? The cosine expansion is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. It's going to alternate, right? But it's the only even powers. x to the sixth over the 6 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. And then we have the general term. So x to the 2n over the 2n factorial. All right, so there was our cosine expansion. Now what I want is to have x times that. So we're just going to take this whole thing and we're just going to multiply it all by x. So here we go. The expansion for x cosine of x, uh, it's going to end up being, right, multiply everything by x. So x minus x cubed over 2 factorial plus x to the fifth over the 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over the, whoops, not 6th, uh, not 6th. Ah, fix it. Okay, here we go. It was x to the 7th over the 6 factorial. Let's see, 1, 3, yeah, that's right. There was the four non-zero terms. Good, plus dot, dot, dot. The alternatingness hasn't changed. So that part of the general term is the same. The factorial piece hasn't changed. Uh, all I did was I added 1 to the exponent. So here we go, 2n plus 1. That's that new exponent. And then that would be our answer. There's our expansion for the x cosine x function. You take the cosine function and you manipulate it. You don't have to rebuild everything from scratch. That would be a pain in the butt to do. Could we do it? Yes. I could take derivatives of this and then tack on everything. But like, why? Why would you do that? Don't do that. That's dumb. Don't be dumb. Right, just take the cosine expansion and manipulate it. It is so much easier. And now here we've got the integral. Uh, do we want to try to do the integral of x cosine x? Do you want to do integration by parts? I don't. I would much rather do the integration of the thing that's already expanded. Right? Could we do the integration by parts? Figure out what is that integrated formula and then build the expansion? Yes, but uh, I don't want to. Let's just integrate the expansion. Okay, so here we go. Part B. We have the integration from 0 to x of x cosine x. Uh, or I guess it needs to start with t's. Okay, t cosine t. dt. Uh, I said dt and I wrote dx. I'm tired, but oh well, I've got to make these videos for tomorrow. Here we go. Uh, so let's take this expansion. We're just going to change it from... Uh, we're going to change it from t's, uh, x's to t's, and then we're going to integrate it. All right, so here we go. Let's set it up. Uh, we're going to have the integration from 0 to x. Change everything to t's. So t minus t cubed over 2 factorial plus t to the fifth over the 4 factorial minus, does this one need the general? Oh, sometimes it doesn't ask for the general term, so then I can just stop. Oh, well, minus, uh, that's going to be t to the seventh over the 6 factorial plus then we had the general term, uh, t to the 2n plus 1 over the 2n factorial. You don't necessarily always have to write out everything. Uh, but there we go. We're integrating that whole thing, and it goes on infinitely, but, but that's okay. Uh, let's integrate it. Now we're going to integrate it, and we're going we're to plug in x for t, and then what's nice, the lower evaluation is going to kill everything. 
here we go. Let's integrate. That's going to be uh, t squared over 2 minus, if I add 1 to the exponent, it's going to be to the fourth. So I'm going to have 4 times the 2 factorial plus, if I add 1 to the exponent and divide by that new number, right? Notice how I'm not multiplying out. Like I could figure out that, that 4 factorial is just some number and I could multiply it by 6, but I really don't want to. I want to leave it like this so I can hopefully see the pattern a little bit easier. That's going to be t to the 8, and then you're going to divide by the 8. We already had the 6 factorial. And then let's look at the general term. The alternatingness hasn't changed. The positive terms are still positive. The negative terms are still negative. All right, so I still have that negative 1 to the n. The, that factorial piece hasn't changed. But what's different now is I'm going to have t to the 2n plus 2, and I'm going to have to divide by 2n plus 2. I had to add 1 to that exponent and then divide by that new number. And then I have to evaluate it. Plugging in x, is this going to change all the t is to x? And then we're going to change, uh, we're going to change the, the lower evaluation is just going to be 0. And technically, I guess this should be an approximation. I, I kind of messed up there. It should be an approximation. All right, so here we go. We're going to change all the t's to x's. Everything plugging in 0, right? That's just going to kill everything. We don't really need to do it. Uh, but here we go. This integration. Right? The integration of this thing, f t dt, here we go, we're going to have x squared over 2, and then we're going to have minus x to the fourth over 4 times 2 factorial plus x to the sixth over 6 times 4 factorial minus x to the eighth. It's kind of annoying. You had to change it from x to t as then we integrate and we change back from t's to x's. So, okay. Then the general term still alternates, and then it's x to the 2n plus 2, and then we're going to divide by 2n plus 2, and then we still have that 2n factorial piece. The lower evaluation is all zero. Like I said, I don't need that bracket because I don't have one at the front. Uh, but there we have it. Right? This would be the answer. Let's see if I can box it all. I kind of cropped it off a little bit. Oh, well, there we go. That would be the answer. Again, could we build it from scratch? Yes, uh, but you would have to use integration by parts, uh, and then you'd have to then take the derivatives and then do it all. Uh, that wouldn't be very fun. The integration of the expansion is the expansion of the integral. Okay, so do the integral first, and then you can just do the expansion of that integral. Right? We can do these manipulation techniques basing off the sine, the cosine, and the, and the, and the exponential uh, those are the common ones. We could do stuff like sine of x squared or x cosine x. We can do the manipulations, and, that, and then if I have to take a derivative or take an integral, so be it. But these manipulation techniques are much faster and much easier uh, than trying to rebuild all these new ones from scratch. All right, let's see here. It says, why do we care about finding a Taylor series? For instance, why is it important to know? Well, well sometimes we just don't really have the algebraic firepower to really compute something, uh, and so we could end up using a series as a way to get a really, really good approximation. We talked about that when we kind of did that calculator example. If we can't do something by hand, well, uh, we can sometimes get a series approximation for it, and that series approximation can get really, really, really good, uh, and so if we can't do something by hand, maybe we could do a series. Kind of like how sometimes we use tangent line to approximate functions. Now we're just basically like multiplying that like 500 to do a series. But that, that series is typically going to give us a pretty good approximation and pretty, pretty darn quickly. Here we go. Let's, let's do this next example. It says use the Maclaurin series for sine to approximate sine of 1 so that the error in our approximation is less than 1 over 1,000 without using our calculator. Uh-oh. Uh, it says justify that your error is less than Let's think about what that, that sine of 1 expansion would be. Let's, let's start with sine of x, right? Let's recap it. Sine of x is, it's the odd power, so it's not 1. One's, one's an even power. Uh, so it's x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over the 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over the 7 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Right? There's your expansion for sine of x. So that means sine of 1 plug it in, it's going to be 1 minus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 5 factorial, plugging in 1 for x, uh, minus 1 over 7 factorial. What do we notice about that? Oh, it 
it's alternating. And remember, we, we have an alternating series error bound from the previous packet. All right, so let's see. It's going to be an alternating series, so I can use the alternating series error bound. Uh, let's think about what these terms are going to look like. Right, here's sine of 1. 1 is 1. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. So that's 6. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Or it's the 3 factorial times 5, five times 4. So that's, 20, uh, that's 24. And times 5, that's 120. So 5 to the factorial, uh, or 5 factorial, that's 120. Now 7 factorial is, is kind of big, right? It's, it's 5 factorial, 120, times 6 times 7. So I know that's going to be 42. 42 is 6 times 7. 42 times 120. And that series would keep going forever. But I'm not really going to need uh, to keep going. Because what do we notice about this denominator? 42 times 120. Well, let's think. Uh, we, we need an error term to be less than 1 over 1,000. That means I'm looking for the first term that's smaller than that, which means I need a denominator that's bigger than 1,000. Well, guess what? 100 times 10 would be 1,000. 42 is bigger than 10. 120 is bigger than 100. So I know for sure without having to multiply it out, now, 42 times 120, that's going to be bigger than 1,000. And if that's going to be bigger than 1,000, well, then that's my error term. And then for these alternating series error bounds, right, that's going to end up being the first term in my tail. So since that's my error term, I really only needed the first three for the actual approximation. So here we go. The answer sine of 1 is approximately 1 minus 1 sixth plus 1 over 120. That's our approximation. And then we'd say by the alternating series error bound, we know uh, the max error is going to be less than the next term. Uh, so let's say next than the next term. So therefore, max error is going to be less than the absolute value. Oh my gosh, about to see is hopefully not. The negative doesn't matter, but it's negative 1 over 42 times 120. Now remember, that's bigger than 1,000. Therefore, that's going to be less than uh, 1 over 1,000. The bigger denominator means the smaller fraction. The absolute value means the negative doesn't matter. Uh, but I know like that denominator is bigger than a thousand, so that's my error term. Uh, and so there we go, right? We, we've got it, right? And that was the requisite error that it wanted us to show. And it's important that you cited the alternating series error bound. These terms alternated in sign, they decreased in magnitude since the denominators get bigger, the terms get smaller, and that limit is going to be zero. So I can use the alternating series error bound. And that means the error is less than the absolute value of that next term. I found the error term. I found the term that was small enough to have my requisite error. And then everything before it was the approximation. Okay, and it says use the calculator to actually find this approximation. Okay, so here we go. The max error is going to be less than the absolute value. I'm, I'm, I'm done with the absolute value. Okay, the, the absolute value just kills the negative. Uh, but actually, no, I guess for the error, uh, we need to find uh, the, I guess this is really wanting the, the true one. Okay, so let, let's go for it. Um, remember, the error in general is exact. It doesn't want the error bound. That's what we were doing. It wants the actual error. So it wants the error, uh, the exact minus the approximation. Okay. So here we go. This is what it wants us to do for the error. The exact solution Sign of one. Make sure your calculator is in radian mode, right? Because if it's in degrees, you're going to get a wrong answer. So I could take sine of one and then subtract uh, my approximation, which was one minus one sixth plus one over twenty. Okay, so there we go. We could take that sine of one with your calculator, then you can subtract our approximation. By the way, that is, uh, let's see, this is point uh, eighty four fifteen minus all that stuff. If you combine it, it's 101 out of 120. Therefore, the error uh, is going to end up being it's 0. 
1957. Come on. Here we have it. Uh, error is exact minus the approximation. We have the error bound. And, and we know like that error is, is less than uh, that 42 times the 120, right? That's the max error here we actually found what the true error was. Exact minus the approximation. Make sure your calculators and reading. Because if it's in degrees, oof, thanks for playing. Alrighty, let's keep going. We need to do, I know this is a long, this is a long day. I'm sorry. I'm trying to go fast. I want to go home too. Uh, let's keep going though. We need to do more. Let's get out of there. Yep, and then let's do the next couple pages. More, uh, more manipulations. There we go, that's at the top. It says find in series form an antiderivative, aka okay, the integral, or sine of x squared, and we're going to use it to approximate the integral uh, from, from 0 to 1. Okay, so again, that's, that's a non integrable function. We couldn't do that by hand, but we can build the series and we can integrate the series, and we know that series is going to give us a pretty good approximation, and we can always add in more terms in order to get it. Right, but here we go. This integration going from 0 to 1, sine of x squared dx. I think we've already done this, but we can, we can just set it up. Uh, not equals. It's going to be about. So we've already done this, right? We take the sine expansion and we change the x's to x squared. We did this a couple of examples ago, and this one was x squared, and it was minus x to the 6th over the 3 factorial, and it was plus x to the 10th over the 5 factorial. Remember, the exponent on the top was just twice as big, and it was minus x to the uh, 14th over the 7 factorial. Okay, that's probably enough. Uh, so we could integrate it, and then we could plug in the 1 and the 0, and then hopefully we'll be able to be... Okay, here we go. So that's going to be x cubed over 3 minus x to the 7 over 7 times 3 factorial plus uh, x to the 11th over 11 times 5 factorial minus x to the 15th over 15 times 7 factorial. We could keep going, but hopefully we're not going to need any more terms. If we have to somehow go back and get more terms, yeah, so be it. But I think we'll probably be okay. If we plug in 1, then plug in 0. Plugging in 0 is going to be nice. All the terms are going to go away. So that lower evaluation doesn't matter. So we're going to end up getting, uh, we have just 1 over 3 minus 1 over 7 times 3 factorial plus 1 over 11 times 5 factorial minus 1 over, I love plugging in 1s. And so that's what our series approximation would be. And we just need to figure out, okay, how many terms do we need in order uh, to have this requisite amount of error? Now, again, this is going to be alternating. So we can use the alternating series error bound. right? So alternating series error bound. Remember, we know the max error is just going to be less than the absolute value of that first omitted or that first unused term, right? That's the big thing that we should remember. Alternating series error bounds. You got to find which term is the error term, which term is small enough to, to have our error, which term is smaller than one over a thousand, AKA which denominator is bigger than a thousand. Got to find the error term and then the partial sum will be everything prior to it. Uh, let's think five factorial, if you remember, was 120. 11 times 120 that's going to be bigger than 1,000, right? 5 factorial is 120, 120, 100 times 10 would be 1,000. 11 is bigger than 10, 5, 5, 5 factorial is bigger than 100. So, so that term right there, right, that is my error term. Right? That's the term that since the denominator is bigger than 1,000, that's the term that overall is less than 1 over 1,000. So that means my answer, uh, this integration from 0 to 1 of sine squared dx, uh, the answer is, is we're only going to want the first two. And then the max error uh, is that, that third term by itself. Right? And then again, since the since this series alternates in sign, decreases in magnitude, and then has a limit that's zero, we could use that alternating series error bound, and then we have that max error. Max error here is going to be less than the absolute value of 1 over the 11 times the 5 factorial, uh, but, but that's going to be greater than 1,000, so that's overall less than 1 over 1,000.
thousand. Come on, come on, come on, you can do it. There we go, third time's a charm. All right, so by the alternating series error bound, you had to make sure it could, it could work, right? It had to be alternating, got to decrease in magnitude, got to have the limit zero. It's got to fit the conditions before you can use it. Uh, but that alternating series error bound was good. And then if we were to do that approximation, uh, so if we were to actually do it, remember the error is we're going to take the exact minus the approximation. We're really going to do the absolute value, so we don't care. If we were to do this integration, ooh, ooh, and then subtract our approximation, which was one third minus, uh, let's see, three factorial is just six. That's going to be one over 42. Uh, we could do this. We could find our approximation, which, by the way, that ends up being 13 out of 42. Uh, if we took the math 9 value, so we can math 9 that with our calculator, and then we could get that the approximation we could have, uh, and then we could find that our max error for us is going to end up, or our exact error is 0 0.000745. That's a pretty small error. How many terms did we use? Two. Uh, it did not take very many terms to end up getting a very good approximation. And even if I went one more term, right, if I went one more term now, that would be the maximum error. 15 times 7 factorial is going to be a very big number. So 1 over that very big number is a very small number. So even if I just went one more term, I could make this thing extremely accurate. By the way, how do you think the calculator does it? You think it's just sitting there doing Riemann sums and adding all those errors of all those rectangles together? No, right? The, the calculator has this, uh, this thing programmed into it. It has the Taylor series programmed into it. It just does quite a few terms to make sure that our error is going to be really, 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 really small. If humans do not know how to do this, the calculator also doesn't know how to do it. Humans just know how to, how to approximate that very closely. Right? By, by making a series that approximates it and then integrating the series, the calculator just does enough terms that essentially the error is negligible. Right? Even with two terms, that error is pretty small. If we did a third term, it would probably match like five or six zeros. And then if we did like 10 terms, we, we probably wouldn't have enough zeros on the screen to, 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 to signify how small the error is. Right? That's, that's kind of nice how the calculator can do that, how, how your programming is. Uh, can do that. It's got series kind of behind the screens uh, in a lot of it. All right, let's do the next one. I know, a lot of stuff today. A lot of stuff basically for this whole unit. All right, part A, it says write a Maclaurin expansion for E. Okay, we've already done this, right? We know E, it's everything. Uh, so E was 1 plus X plus X squared over the 2 factorial uh, plus it was all positive, x cubed over the 3 factorial plus dot, 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 and then it was x to the n over the n factorial, right? We did that earlier. Very good. We could build it from scratch, but we hopefully shouldn't have to. Uh, we, we did that earlier. Now it says, use that answer to A to find the limit of f of x minus 1 over 2x as, as x goes to 0. Okay, so we want to take this thing, right? This is my function. I want to take f. And instead of using the function, I want to use that approximation. So here we go. Limit as x is approaching 0. We're going to plug in the polynomial or the, that series for our function. So we've got 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot, 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 plus x to the n over n factorial. So let's take all that stuff. Then we're going to subtract 1. Then we're going to divide it by 2x. Let's see what happens. Right? So it's kind of nice. We could plug in and try to do L'Hopital's rule by using e to the x. But what if we actually wanted to use the series instead? Let's go for it. Here we go. That one and that one are going to cancel. Right? That's why we needed that minus 1 to cancel out that one at the beginning. And now everything else is going to reduce by a uh, power of x. Right? We're going to cancel 1x. So here, that's going to reduce, and that's going to be 1. That's going to reduce, that's going to be x. That's going to end up being x squared. This is going to end up being x to the n minus 1. But everything just gets reduced. But what happens to all of those terms that still have x's? The x is going to go to 0. So that term is going to go to 0. That term is going to go to 0. 
all of these terms in here are going to go to zero. What are we left over with? Just this. So this answer ends up being one on the top, and then we have the two on the bottom. That answer ends up being one half. It's kind of nice. We could just take that series, plug it in for f, the ones cancel, the, then the x's will reduce, then all the rest of the x's go to zero, and we end up just having one half. Right, so there we have it. You could have used L'Hopital's rule if you wanted, right? but, but the series is just showing you a different way that it could have been done. Sometimes L'Hopital's rule is, is not necessarily the easiest way. Like if it's a really hideous, ugly function, e to the x was pretty easy. So L'Hopital's rule could have been done pretty easily. Right, this limit, as x goes to zero, uh, e to the x uh, minus one over two x, you would be zero over zero to start with, right? Zero over zero, so you could use L'Hopital's rule. Uh, but then if I did the derivative on the top and the derivative on the bottom, and then if I tried to evaluate it, e to the zero is one, right? So L'Hopital's rule would work, right? And L'Hopital's rule for this case would be easier. But, but sometimes the series is actually easier. It just depends on how nasty your function is and how, how tricky that, that corresponding derivative work would be. But that series is a very good way to get an approximation also, or to get the value also. No, I don't want to do that. No, sorry. I want to clear that one. All right, let's keep going. 30 minutes down. I feel like I've been going forever. Oh, well. Okay, so here we're going to talk about the last kind of main idea. We're just going to do uh, this page and then one more, and then we're going to be done. Okay, so here we're going to kind of see some, some like sneaky geometric series come up for us. All right, so let's look at these. It says um, um, geometric series are formed by multiplying the common ratio. Yeah, we know. Uh, suppose I told you to start with the first term of 2, and then the ratio was going to be Three. Well, what geometric series would we write? Okay, well, the first term is 2. 2 times 3 would be 6. 6 times 3 would be 18. 18 times 3 is 54, right? So we could find all those terms. Remember, a sequence is just going to have the list of numbers separated by commas, but now we would want to add them all together. And then the general term, you'd have the, the a and then your ratio to the n minus 1. Uh, so there's, I guess, probably just n since we start with n equals 0, likely. And then plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so, so there would be our geometric series written all out, right? And we have the general term 2 times 3 to the nth power. Uh, what, if, what if a was 2 and the ratio was negative 3? Well, it would look slightly different. It would be 2 minus 6 plus 18 minus 54 plus dot, 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 dot. And then we'd have that general term, which would be negative 3 to the nth power dot, 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 afterwards. Okay, well, what if, what if we wanted to write a geometric series, and what if the first term was uh, 1, and what if the ratio was x? Well, the first term is 1, and the ratio is x, so the next term is going to be x. And the term after that is x times x, and the term after that is x times x times x, right? It's x squared times x. And then we'd have x to the fourth, and then dot, 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 and then this one's going to end up being x to the n. Right, there's my there's my formula for the nth term. Uh, that's a geometric series. It's got the first term of 1, and then it's got that ratio of x. And that's what that infinite series would be right, if we expanded it all out. But remember, we also have a formula for the infinite summation. That formula for the infinite sum is a, the first term, over 1 minus r. So if the infinite sum could be written as that expanded series, and the infinite sum could also fit this formula. Transitive property means those things got to be equal. The first term was 1, and then 1 minus the ratio. So look, if I had a function that was 1 over 1 minus x, I kind of call that a hidden geometric series because the expansion of it would be all of this stuff. Right? It's kind of hard to see. But, but that, uh, that function, the 1 over 1 minus x, which I think was one of those other commonly used ones a couple of pages ago, uh, that one's a hidden geometric. The first term is 1, the ratio is x. And really, uh, how we're going to identify it is if I can somehow take this, and if I can somehow manipulate it to match my infinite summation, well then I can, I can actually expand it pretty quickly and pretty easily. 
these hidden geometric ones are kind of a little bit uh, sneaky. Uh, let's go for it. We're just going to do the rest of this kind of topic, and then uh, we'll finally be done. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Uh, let's try to get it all on the screen. Mr. Bell, you're struggling today. You know. All right, here we go. A geometric series converges to the sum, right, A over 1 minus R, and that ratio has to be less than 1, right? If the ratio is not less than 1, we're going to have a problem. Uh, so let's say if we have a power series, and that power series is 1 over 1 minus x squared. Uh, let's write out the first four non-zero terms and the general term, and then we're going to figure out the interval of convergence. For what values of x does that sucker converge? Well, first of all, we could take derivatives, and we could just tack on, right? We could evaluate it at the center, and then we could tack on all the stuff. We could brute force it. But if we can recognize it <clears throat> as geometric, it's going to be faster. Can I potentially take this and manipulate it to look like this? Well, yeah, and in fact, it kind of already is. Right? If I have a over 1 minus r, uh, here the a value is 1. Uh, the 1 minus is 1, and then what's my, what's my radius? What's my ratio? Uh, x squared. Okay, so this one is geometric, uh, and the first term is 1, and then the ratio is x squared. So here we go. This expansion, you don't have to do all the derivative stuff. You can just do the expansion, first term, then the next term, and then the term after. Just keep multiplying by the ratio. And then we needed four, so I need one more, x to the sixth. And then plus dot, dot, dot. Notice those are only even powers because it's going to keep going up by a factor of x squared each time. So this general term is just going to be x to the 2n. There we go. Right? That's it. That's the expansion that it wanted us to do. Now we have to do the interval of convergence for it. Now, what's nice is for geometric stuff, for these geometric series, I really don't have to do ratio test. You could if you want. But remember, we already know if the ratio is less than one, it will converge. Uh, so, so I'm really good to go. All I'm gonna have to do is take that ratio and then set it uh, less than one. So here we go, that ratio was x squared. That's going to have to be less than 1. If I drop the absolute values, then that means, uh, and then really, it's, I guess you could square root it and then take the absolute value. Uh, but here we're going to get that this inequality is going to be negative 1 to 1. And what's really nice about this, right, that's my interval of convergence. What's really nice about these geometric ones is for the geometric series, you do not, do not have to check the endpoints. When we did that radius and interval of convergence stuff uh, last time, we typically would find the framework and then we would figure out, okay, what's, what's the left side, what's the right side? Of course, the center should be right in the middle and that's our framework for our interval and then we have to test the endpoints. But if you know it's geometric, the endpoints will not work. Right, the inequality is strictly less than 1, and so it's going to be strictly less than, strictly less than. You don't have to test the endpoints if you know it's geometric. Okay, so that's nice. We got the radius, uh, we got the interval of convergence. By the way, the center of this thing is at 0. The radius is 1. That's cool. We got the interval negative 1 to 1. Now let's look at the part. Uh, I guess it's not part B, but it says on the calculator, let's graph it, and let's graph the first five terms. Uh, and then you're going to trace them, and then we're going to say, what do we notice? Well, I'm not going to get the calculator. I'm going to kind of save that time. Uh, but if you were to type in that 1 over 1 minus x squared, and if you were to type in 1 plus x squared plus x to the 4 plus x to the 6 plus x to the 8, which is the fifth term, uh, then what you notice is, is those two things are going to be very, very, very close together, especially at x equals 1 half, right? Those two graphs are going to be very close together. And the reason why they're close together for x equals 1 half is because 1 half is in the interval of convergence. But the two things, the graph of the function and the graph of that series for the first five terms, they're going to be very, very, very far apart for the x equals 2 because 2 is not in the interval of convergence. Okay, so the series is a good approximation for something like 1 half, uh, but not a very good approximation for, for 2. And it's because of whether that value is in the interval of convergence or not. Right? We don't want to use a series to approximate something unless it is in 
the interval of convergence. All right, a little bit more and then we're done. I know this, this is long. Here we go, one more page. We're doing good though. 40 minutes, that's actually not too terrible. Sure, so I had the, like 20 minutes of the first video, but oh well. <clears throat> All right, this is it. We got just these two examples and then some stuff at the bottom. Cool, here we go. It says find a power series for uh, 12 over 4 plus x. Uh, our centered at x equals 0. Give the first four non-zero terms and the zero terms and then find, of course, that, that interval converges. Find the values where it converges. Here we go. All right, this one's hidden geometric also, but it takes a little bit more work to recognize it. Let's see, I've got 12 over 4 plus x. Remember, that formula is a over 1 minus r. I want it 1 minus in that bottom left chunk. Okay, so that's what I want. Now, whatever the number on the top is, whatever, whatever the term in that bottom right is, whatever, I need it 1 minus in the bottom left. Let's divide by 4 first. Okay, so this would be 3 over 1 plus uh, x over 3. Okay, so I've got the 1 but I need it to be 1 minus. Okay, so check it out. I've got 3 over 1 minus negative x over 3. That's the same thing, right? x plus uh, 1 plus x over, ooh, it shouldn't be x over 3. It should be 4, right? Because I divided by 4. My bad. That's a 4. That should be a 4. Fix it. I'm glad I caught it pretty soon. Instead of having 1 plus that chunk, you could also write 1 minus negative of that chunk. And so now I can see that like this one is going to end up being geometric. The first term here is 3, and the ratio is negative x over 4. So that one took a little bit of manipulation. But uh, now I can build it pretty fast and pretty easy. Here we go. The expansion for this function f, right, which was, uh, which was the 12 over the 4 plus x. That expansion, the first term is 3. And then uh, we have the next term. So we do 3 times the negative x over 4, so it would be minus. 3x over 4, and it's going to be plus, and we'd have, uh, the top doesn't really change. The top's still going to be 3, but you're going to get another x, so 3x squared over 16, minus 3x cubed over 16 times 4 would be 64. That's 1, 2, 3, 4 non-zero terms. Very good. Plus dot, 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 plus, and then we need the general term. All right, here we go. That's going to be a 3, and then remember, it's just it's geometric, so you can just write a geometric. It's negative x over 4 to the nth power. There we go. All right, so there is our expansion. Uh, recognizing that it's a hidden geometric is actually much faster uh, than trying to take the derivatives and build it from scratch. And it's going to converge if the ratio is less than 1. Okay, so here we go. When I drop the absolute values, that's going to do the plus, or, uh, the, the plus or minus. So I've got uh, the negative Actually, it's going to deal with the negative 2, right? Um, actually, let's, let's multiply by the 4 first. Sometimes you can kind of choose what order you want to do this in. Let's multiply by 4. So I've got the negative absolute value of x. That's going to be less than 4. And then the plus or minus, uh, that's going to end up telling me, okay, negative 4 to 4. Uh, that will be my interval of convergence. And again, you don't have to test the endpoints. For geometrics, the endpoints will not work. Guarantee it. The endpoints will not work. Can you test them if you want to? Sure, uh, but you don't have to. The endpoints won't work if it's geometric. Uh, the center's at zero, the radius is four, but the interval is from negative four to four. Okay, last one, last one. And this one's gonna be a little bit trickier. Uh, well, let's go for it. It says, find a power series, five over uh, four minus x, centered at three. Oof, this one's centered at three. And that's, that's a little bit of a problem. The last one was centered at zero. Uh, so remember, if it was centered at zero, I really needed like an x minus zero to the nth power, or, or therefore I just needed an x uh, to the whatever power. And I had that. <laughs> but here, uh, I'm, I'm going to need an x minus three uh, on the first term. Really, I'll, I guess nothing on the first term. Then on the n equals one term, I'd need this. Then I would need to the second. Uh, then I would need it to the third row. I'm going to need each chunk to have an x minus 3 power, and then that thing's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So somehow, my ratio is going to involve this. Now, it could have some extra stuff. It could have some extra stuff. But an x minus 3 to the nth power, that is going to have to be in the ratio. 
So that's the only way that when you multiply out those terms that everything ends up having that x minus 3 chunk and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as that list writes out. So this one's going to be a little bit harder. We're going to have to specifically, uh, why does it do that? Uh, we're going to have to be a little bit more careful about how we manipulate it, knowing that I need the ratio to somehow have an x minus 3 chunk in it. Okay, so this one's going to be a little bit harder, but let's go for it. We start off with 5 over 4 minus x. Let's manipulate it. I'm going to divide. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to create the, the, the center that I need first. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to have 4 minus, and I'm going to have x minus 3. And let's see, I took x minus 3. How could I keep that balanced? Minus 3. Okay, so minus 3. There we go. Don't worry. Minus negative. Uh, that's really a plus 3 in the parentheses. But I'm creating that shift that I need. Right? I need this for the shift. I need that chunk to be there because the center uh, is going to end up being at x equals 3. So I need an x minus 3 to be in my ratio. So I kind of split it up. And now let's, let's kind of keep some stuff balanced. Let's then combine this. Right? The minus 3 was just kind of keeping it balanced. Keep balanced. Kind of like completing the square almost. Keep balanced. And then let's recombine everything. The 4 minus the 3. Here we go. We've got 5 over 4 minus 3 is 1 minus x minus 3. Well, look at that. That's not actually too bad. It was a little bit weird, uh, but, but that's actually pretty good now. Now that one is going to end up being geometric. The first term there is 5. And then what's my ratio? Uh, just x minus 3. So here we go. This one's going to be able to be uh, pretty good. Let's write it. We've got 5 over 4 minus x. That's my function. We can write the approximation. The first term is 5. And the next term is going to be 5 times the ratio. So the next term is going to be 5 times x minus 3. Then the next term would be 5. Then I multiply by the ratio again. So it's going to be x minus 3 squared. Then the one after that would be x minus 3 Cube. You see how all of these terms have that x minus 3 chunk, and that chunk is raising powers. Uh, and then let's do plus dot, dot, dot. The general term is going to be 5x minus 3 to the nth power. And now every single one of those chunks had the correct x minus c piece. If I didn't create this in my ratio, uh, like we didn't on the previous question, if my ratio didn't have that x minus 3-ness in it, then I wouldn't have had that correct x minus 3, x minus 3 squared, x minus 3 cubed. I wouldn't have had that correct power building up in my expansion. But there we go. We've got the expansion. Now let's just find the interval of convergence. Remember, it's going to converge when uh, the ratio, which was x minus 3, is less than 1. This one's pretty easy. Negative 1 to 1, add the 3. So it's going to end up converging negative 1 plus 3 is 2, and then 1 plus 3 is 4. So there is your interval of convergence, right, from 2 to 4, and you do not have to test the endpoints. The endpoints are not going to work. Uh, so that one is a little bit tricky, right? The, when the center was at 0, you really didn't have to worry about having that specific piece as, as necessary to have that correct x minus c, x minus c squared, whatever. Uh, but if the center is shifted, you, you kind of have to create that same shift in your ratio. It's a little bit hard, but hopefully it makes sense. Let me just scroll up and let me see what this note is, and then we'll be done for today. I know, long lesson today. Hopefully it's okay. It says, if the center is shifted, then so too must the polynomial be, or so too must the series be. They have to match. If the center is moved from x equals 0 to 5, then that polynomial is going to have to be shifted, right? And if the center is at c, then every term in that expansion is going to have to have a power of x minus c, right? So, so sometimes we may have to do that extra algebra work to create that x minus c piece, right? It's got to be part of the ratio, and it's kind of like that completing the square idea. Ooh, okay, that was a lot. Thank you guys. I hope you guys watched the videos. Uh, I know, sorry, this unit is just really heavy. We go really fast, and it's kind of weird. I hope you guys are kind of following along pretty good. If not, no one ever asks any questions, so I don't know what else I can really do for you. Sorry for this. I know it's an asynchronous day today. Uh, I know videos are not just super fun, but it kind of is what it is. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, remember, really what we have, uh, let, me, let me get that out of there. Uh, we have the homework. 
over uh, Taylor. Come on, go away, black thing. Uh, we have the homework over Taylor polynomials. That was the first one. We should be able to get all that one done, right? And so that one should be pretty doable by now. And then we have a couple of other homework assignments. The next homework assignment is the radius. Come on, smart board. This is really, mm, we have the radius and the interval of convergence. Oh, that's not convergence. Come on, convergence. And really, that's the front side of one worksheet. Uh, so that was the first homework, Taylor polynomials. Hopefully, that one should be good right now. We covered the radius and the interval of convergence stuff uh, last time, so that one should be done. And then, really, what we covered today, it was enough for you to do power series one, and then the next one is homework uh, power two. I think it's just power two, or maybe it's power series two. Power series one is the back of the radius in the interval of convergence. Now, I believe in Schoology, there's two different assignments, but it's the same PDF that's going to be attached to them. I believe technically we should have enough covered uh, to be able to do all of that stuff. Now, of course, this is a whole lot going on. This one should be done. Uh, and then just try to get those, those done and turned in. I believe for us, again, if you're watching this and some of you that's not 2021, these dates are, are relevant to us. We should hopefully have all of the radius and interval convergence, then the backside, which is power series one, and then the next homework worksheet. If you can have all of those done by the 15th, that would be wonderful. But if you need the weekend to kind of do it, that's okay. But we will have power series three that'll be done after next time's class as well. But just try to keep up with the homework. I know we're going pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, just try to keep up. We should be done up through Power Series 2 now. But remember, radius and interval convergence, Power Series 1, that's one PDF. The front's radius and interval convergence. Once you finish with that, submit that assignment. And then once you're ready to do Power Series 1, it's the back. Submit that uh, separately. Uh, but there we go. Those are kind of the homeworks that are coming. And the next time, we're going to do a little bit more in the notes and then we'll be able to do the Power Series 3 worksheet as well. Thank you, guys.